Uh, thanks a lot, guys. And uh, since there aren't really too many of you, I would try to uh, invite you a bit closer. And uh, because this is, from my perspective, this is going to be a storytelling. So, so I will generally start with the fact that if you're not interested in hearing the story of how ISI got started and how we moved through, through all the things that happened, uh, probably then you don't have to move any time, anything closer. But if you want to ask questions, then the closer you are, the easier it is going to be for me to hear them, actually. Um, but yeah, we've, we've, done, um, we've done quite a lot, actually, over the last five years. And we've been several places. So I will try to give you a bit of a, of a feedback and background on, on how everything started and uh, what changed since, since the beginning and how we moved forward with, with things. So uh, um, right, the iSight project was, was born as a part of a joint venture formation course between Alto Business School and uh, Stanford Business School. Uh, it actually turned out to be, funnily enough, that the same professor was teaching both our course as the Skybox guys' course. So, so ultimately, we, we share him as, as our roots. And uh, uh, yeah, at that course, we basically were thinking of, of how to utilize the knowledge that we, we gained once building nano satellites at the university. And we thought that building a lot of small satellites would, would be extremely exciting. And we started thinking what to, what to basically do with, with these. And um, we bumped into a a niche market back then, and we thought it's going to be extremely excited, which was ice monitoring for, for Arctic. Especially Northern Shipping Route was, was the one that we were extremely interested in. So we started looking into synthetic aperture radar, as, uh, which is the instrument that we are basically using, uh, as um, Arctic is extremely dark and very cloudy often. And the SAR allows you to see through clouds and during the darkness. So this, this whole idea of, of putting SAR or building a new SAR satellite uh, emerged in, in 2012 during the course. And, and as you can see, this was actually the first draft of the design of the satellite that we made. And as you will see through the presentation, it actually uh, it, it has changed significantly. And, and any of you guys that uh, have ever seen a synthetic aperture satellite, you will very clearly notice and very quickly that, that this, is, this is a wrong design, actually. It's, it's significantly, significantly wrong, and it, it doesn't make too much sense. But this is definitely something that we started with. Uh, I also like, just wanted to mention that I, I actually really enjoyed making this presentation. It made me go through a lot of pictures, and I thought that this is what I'm going to share with you guys. So we'll kind of get to see the, the frames from, from our story. Um, so indeed, as, men as mentioned, the first business plan that we built, and, and maybe I will touch a little bit on something that you guys, uh, or probably as some of you, are trying to do is to gather your first round of financing. So our first round of financing was actually provided by a Finnish funding agency for innovation, or, or in Finland you would call it TECAS. Uh, at a project, as a project at the university in 2012, we applied with a business plan around Arctic monitoring. So we had three activities that we would focus on. It was uh, oil drilling, uh, offshore supply, and Arctic shipping routes. And, and with this plan, we actually built the entire vision of a constellation of six satellites with synthetic aperture radar in order to, to serve these customers. These customers actually back then were extremely excited. And oil and gas was, was a massive market as oil prices were at least 120 bucks a barrel. Uh, it changed, of course, so we, we kind of adapted. Um, but this was our starting point. And why I would like to point this out is to show you that um, the business plan that we had five years ago uh, is not entirely exactly the same or not even close to the business plan that we, we have right now. It's a subset, but we've adopted to the market. We changed as, as market was changing, and uh, we still survived. And I think we, we actually uh, grew a, better, a bigger company, and then we have a plan that's, that's much better right now. Um, so we started again with, with um, a smaller design. I was mentioning during the panel yesterday that uh, whatever your plan is, it's most probably going to take more time and more money than you think it's going to take. Uh, in our case, it also became larger than we thought at first it's going to be. So uh, we were building CubeSats uh, at the university. Alto 1 and Alto 2 were the two CubeSats that we started building from 2010, basically. So we thought that we would be able to squeeze a synthetic aperture radar capability within a CubeSat-like form factor. Uh, and we, we, we made a very thorough plan, but uh, it, it turned out to be impossible, even though the plan was very thorough. Uh, so I will try to also share the story related to uh, how do we approach development of technology. I feel like this is strongly what differentiates the new space approach from the, the old space approach and, and how we moved forward. Because when we were starting the whole adventure with Synthetic Aperture Reader, we actually didn't know that much about it. So uh, the first thing we did after we, we had our idea, we went to library, we rented a lot of books, 
Then we started studying it and we started putting pieces together uh, on a cardboard board in order to actually uh, build something that would be functional. And this was our first prototype that I guess we built within six months from, from the, the inception of the, the project. And you will see as the, the prototypes move, we have probably six of them uh, as they were getting more and more advanced and we were getting more and more confident that we were actually going to be able to do it. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that if we'd start by designing an ultimate product and aim for that over the entire course of time, we would have never made it uh, because our first design was clearly faulty. And the only way for us to, to make sure that we are actually going to make it on time was to build as many prototypes, fail as many times as we can within that time, and then try to get to a, to a moment where we think the, the current prototype is, is functional enough for us to actually launch it into space. Uh, so yes, that's indeed the first one, and uh, we, we tested it outside. We tried to generally test it as, as much as possible. Uh, so whenever we had a prototype, we would try to, of course, launching into space is relatively difficult, but you can try to uh, come closer to than just an echoic chamber. So we would take it outside, we would roll it on this particular uh, cart or vehicle and try to uh, image corner reflectors uh, on the lawn far away, then we would actually put this, this entire plank on board of our airplane. We had access to an aircraft from, from the university. We would use this, this tube on the side where our antenna would go into. Uh, we had guys, as you can see, inside with, with uh, a lot of stuff strapped around. We'd actually still use oscilloscope in order to, uh, to receive uh, ADC signals from, from our radio front end. And, uh, and we were able to capture our first synthetic aperture radar image with, with this prototype. So uh, uh, I also try to, try to show you these images so you will see kind of the improvement as we were moving. And uh, no, we, we gathered this image quite quickly and we realized that of course it's, it's far from, from perfect and, and we need to move on and, uh, and, and develop further. Fortunately, the project that we were granted was two years long, so we were able to, uh, to improve several times before we actually uh, uh, had to had to get out of the university. So the second prototype was a bit larger, uh, but it also was a bit more sturdy. We built everything into a, into a rack box, and then we were able to capture images in, this is actually several images from, a, from the same aircraft uh, that are being joined together, and this is the city of Oulu in the northern Finland. And, uh, and this prototype and this particular piece of data has a certain significance to it because this was the, the result of our uh, probably two years' work that we showed to our customers at ExxonMobil that we were trying to convince for over a year now that we are an uh, exciting startup and that we are going to conquer space in the future and that they should put a lot of money into us because uh, we are the way they are going to uh, do their operations in the future. And uh, I mean, the, the picture must be fantastic because they said yes. So uh, January 2015, we signed a million dollar contract with ExxonMobil actually. And uh, they paid us to capture data of ice with the same instrument that I actually showed you. So we took this audio rack, we mounted it in the same plane that I showed you. We uh, departed to northern Finland where we uh, rented our icebreaker and started doing things. And uh, basically yesterday I also mentioned during my, my presentation that one of the things that I feel like every startup is going to go through is a time of struggle. And uh, this was definitely our time of struggle. So we. We had the contract with Exxon that was signed, but they, of course, didn't want to pay until data was, was delivered. Uh, it was a million dollar contract, but still, the instrument was just, a, just an audio rack, and as you remember, it actually just contained a lot of cables. And we just ran out of money, and we didn't have any private investment. So what we did, we basically took the entire team, we sat down, we said, like, okay, guys, from now on, everyone works free of charge. It's going to take four months before we can get potentially any money. Everything depends on whether we can capture the data or we cannot. Uh, we still got to get all the other stuff, so we, we kind of rented the aircraft from the university that was easier. Uh, harder part was convincing an icebreaker owner to rent it for us free of charge and let us pay in later in the future. Um, even harder was establishing a base because, as you can see, so we built the system into the aircraft, but we also made our ground sta station over there out of two ship containers, which, which we had to pay for, so we took a loan from Nordea Bank, which uh, I'm really thankful to, and uh, we gave actually our personal accounts as collateral, so each of us had a 50,000 loan on their head in order to cover for these expenses. And uh, Exxon was extremely demanding in terms of safety, so we had to purchase 
uh, very expensive safety suits, and that's part why we took took the money. And uh, this is actually the resulting data that we captured out of this this particular project. And believe me or not, this was a successful project. Uh, actually, this data is data that was the best data that we've captured from the last day. And the day before, uh, when they were already quite amazed with, with how the team works and what we've told them about the data that we have captured, even though they haven't seen the data, they invited us for dinner. And uh, once the, we were actually approaching the dinner, the plane landed with the team that you have seen on the previous slide, and the instrument broke completely, and we actually haven't captured any data beforehand. So after the dinner, the entire team returned to the, the ground base where we were soldering throughout the night, and we indeed were able to repair the instrument 5 a.m., and they arrived at 6 a.m., well, after good night's sleep, and they were very excited to see us in the morning, saying, hey, guys, so how, how, was, how was your evening, right? We, we just went straight to bed after the, the dinner, and we're like, yeah, sure, we did so too. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, but it, it actually worked. Uh, the entire instrument was, was assembled together probably half an hour before the flight. Uh, it worked, they got the data, they paid, we paid our loan, we paid the icebreaker, we paid the plane, uh, and this was basically the breakthrough for us because after the contract was executed, we got our Series A investment. So I guess you will guys see this kind of things. I, I, I know in a way you can say that, yeah, we'll be a little bit more lucky, we'll try to plan it better. I think that regardless of how much planning you are going to put into your startup, sooner or later you will have this moment when you will be running out of money. Your team will be there and you will have to make peace with the fact that you're putting everything on one card and it's going to be basically your capabilities to make things happen. This was a logistics nightmare. Believe me, we rented cars, we rented containers. I, I hear stories till now about people telling me how awful the coffee was in the container that they were drinking all night long. But it, it worked, and we managed to grow the company based on that. And uh, a little bit of, of feedback on our, uh, our investing investment round. Here I can share a little bit more insight, guys, if, if you have more questions. We were trying to raise it uh, back through 2014, and we ultimately finished in, in 2015. It took longer. I don't think we were best at it. We've learned a lot. Uh, ultimately, we ended up having a lead investor from San Francisco, True Ventures is our lead investor. The entire round was, was $2.8 million, and actually, it, everything coincided together, actually. We got the Horizon $2.5 million grant a week before we closed the round. So from no money whatsoever, we ended up having $5 million, and the week after the round, we got another $4 million grants from Finnish government. So basically, from being completely bust, we got to $9 million investment. Uh, in November 2015. So, of course, we started growing from there, and um, we moved into a little bit new satellite design. We dropped the idea of CubeSats, we, we moved onwards, and we started actually being more serious about everything. We knew now a little bit more about what to do, what not to do, after all the data we've captured with ExxonMobil. And uh, we actually started building prototypes of satellites, not only instruments. But as you can see, the instrument has improved a little bit as well. Uh, it, it got smaller, it, it got packaged in everything, and ultimately we started getting data that resembled what people would call a synthetic aperture radar data. And this is again captured through clouds and, and through other things. And uh, believe me, from, from there onwards, things started rolling a little bit faster. So with, with all the financing, we managed to hire probably 20 new people to the team. Uh, we were extremely lucky because we relocated people from all, all around the world. So we guys, we have people from, from Australia, from, from Argentina, from, from Russia, from Singapore, from United States, and all of them came to Finland to, to uh, work on this, this exciting project. Uh, we had a bit of a um, give back to the society moment as well, just something I think that uh, each company should try to do every now and then just to make sure that you utilize the potential that's captured within the team. Uh, a friend of mine actually called that was a volunteer during the refugee crisis and asked us whether we would be able to help them detect the rubber bows that are arriving at the coasts of Greek islands during the night, because they have the night vision goggles, but they can't really see too well. And then during the day, it's not a problem, but most of the refugees actually arrive during the night. Um, so we tried to come up with our, the best solution. Of course, airplane was not possible. Turkey didn't allow us to, to fly over there. So we built actually several of those uh, jeeps where we boosted a little bit a standard maritime radar for uh, that one that you would buy for your yacht. We basically bought several of those, we shipped them to Greece, we shipped several people, 
And then we, we established this like a mobile radar platforms to detect boats. And uh, we were actually successful with it. So we donated everything to the Coast Guard after we were done. We were there for a, like a two week mission. We didn't have excess of time, but uh, we definitely tried to do our best. And then, uh, I mean, I get feedback every now and then that they are using it and they are very successful and very, very hip happy with the system. Um, Prototype number four. Prototype number four actually got to a moment where everything is closed in two boxes, and uh, this is such a good hardware that we actually sold this. We have a customer that purchased this particular two boxes for one million euro, and uh, and we also get a lot of feedback that they are very happy with this. So as you can see, we've we've started with a with a piece of cardboard and a lot of items around them, and then once we managed to squeeze them into a, a few aluminium boxes, we we got someone to purchase it. And it captures already wonderful images. It actually captures images uh, with submeter resolution uh, from high distance, high altitude. It's over, over 100 watts in power. Uh, and for those who know, Airborne SARS is actually quite capable. Uh, and a very interesting thing, um, from especially for Airborne SAR, we didn't have a plane. I mean, we did have a plane, but the plane was not easy to be modified. So we had a trouble because we were not really able to, to put anything easily outside. Uh, and it made us figure out a way to image from inside the plane. So we actually figured out a way how to image through windows in the airplane, which turned out to be extremely exciting invention because now we can use any type of aircraft for, from basically a, like an airborne taxi uh, and to rent it per hour and make it a fully SAR capable aircraft within 30 minutes just by putting the instrument on board, gluing an antenna to a window and flying. Uh, and this is actually the, the exciting part about the system that we've built that made the customer purchase it. Um, we are not really in the business of, of selling this instrument, so, so, um, so that was a very special use case, but I, I kind of wanted to show you that the hardware indeed builds up into a, a moment where it's getting extremely valuable. And now, the last, latest moment, this is the actual final uh, satellite. We are, we are actually launching quite soon, so I hope this is not going to change anytime soon. Uh, I get much better renders because we've got already most of the stuff and, and ultimately I can show you that uh, out of all this, this struggle and trouble, uh, four years later, we, we actually have a satellite that, that's capable of doing what we hoped it's going to do. So this is a, a fully functional synthetic aperture radar. Uh, there isn't the remaining part of the satellite. The entire satellite weighs 60 kilograms. Uh, it has three meter antenna, spring loaded, double deployable, uh, Please ask questions if you'd like to know more technical details. But, but what I can say, I mean, it provides four kilowatts, and it actually is the smallest space-capable radar, synthetic aperture radar ever built. And uh, we are actually quite excited about it. So um, I guess enough of the history. I'll try to say what's next. Uh, milestones on our side. We are actually launching three of, of the satellites that I've showed you over the next 12 months. We have uh, launch schedules now for October, December, and February. Uh, and that's 2017, 2017, and 2018. And uh, we're closing another round of financing. We are a little bit better this time, so we are, we are scaling our team, and we would be looking both for uh, partner companies and for, for people that would like to work with us. Uh, as you can see, we, we try to invite a little bit older people every now and then to work with us, uh, as we know that we have a very young team. Uh, Thus, if, um, if you liked what I said and then you enjoy the the general thing, I would encourage you to, to drop us a, a message. And uh, whether you want to work with us or, or partner with us, these are two, two emails I'm especially proud of with, with the work at ISI. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs>